Hello, and welcome to Comic Book Herald's Deep Dives. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. I am joined today by writer supreme John Galati. Every time I ask John if he can get an article done later in the day, he tells me, I did it 35 minutes ago. We are talking <laughs> World of Watchmen today. How's it going, John? I got a bit of a head cold today, so I apologize to all our listeners for that business. But otherwise, it's, I'm excited to talk Watchmen. It is head cold season. We are recording this uh, in November 2019. It's our fourth deep dive here on CBH. We did House of X and Powers of 10 most recently. If you're curious, you can check out the playlist for all deep dives. I'll put in the show notes here. But um, these are these have been fun. It's a big we're doing like big conversations around some of the comics and comics adjacent in this case media that we're most excited about or that raise the most interesting questions to us today. It's Doomsday Clock and HBO Watchmen, right? The world has kind of Watchmen has kind of caught the world by fire yet again uh, here all these, you know, 30 plus years later. So what I really wanted to look at was Doomsday Clock has 11 issues released at this point of a 12 issue mini. Or I guess not many, a 12-issue limited series. Watchmen, HBO's Watchmen, we've seen three episodes. The fourth is going to be released today. So we are in in a state of flux with both, right? Neither has concluded, but I think we have enough to go on where we can start asking questions about how Doomsday Clock is approaching a Watchmen sequel, how HBO Watchmen is approaching a Watchmen sequel, what that tells us about what I have ranked as my number one favorite comic book of all time which is Watchmen, right? Like, I have it there for a reason. I've reread it very recently, and I stand by that claim. I feel pretty good about it, honestly. <laughs> it's all, it's one of those things where, like, I feel like it's not cool to have Watchmen be your favorite comic anymore, you know? I don't know if you yeah. kind of get that vibe from, like, the, the, the culture and sort of the, like, contemporary comics critic. It's definitely a book that has come under fire. Yeah, and for a lot of criticism. Yeah, a lot of fair and, and pretty good reasons. Um, but I maintain that it stands there, and we're going to talk a little bit about, I think, our reasons for why and, and what it means to us. Let's start here. Doomsday Clock, Watchmen. What was your reaction in 2016 when DC Rebirth teased the Watchmen connections? And, and like, almost right off the bat, the explanation is Dr. Manhattan as the catalyst behind the New 52. John, I'll let you start. Uh, I was real apprehensive. Okay. Um you know, the Watchmen up until that point had not had a really great track record of being adapted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the first time was obviously by Snyder, which didn't work out. And then the next one was uh, before Watchmen, that kind of series of miniseries that were put out by like Darwin Cook and Brian Azzarello and people, uh, yeah. which was better, but still didn't quite hit the mark. So I was kind of thinking like, I don't know that third time is going to be a charm here. I'll stand by uh, that Darwin Cook Minuteman series. It's actually it's good. It's quite. I mean, it's Darwin Cook, so it looks yeah, amazing. Yeah. But it also like, I know that I know this isn't the focus of what we're going to talk about. It takes the more ideas of Minutemen that are all mm -hmm. mysterious, and it actually fleshes them out in some kind of mildly surprising ways. But anyway, if you're going to read any before Watchmen, I say read Minutemen and then probably let the rest go. Yeah, like you could read one issue of Brian Azzarello just to marvel in the fact that he knows how to write Rorschach's tone, and that's... Yeah. Um, though, I don't know, you could make an argument for the Silk Spectre comic that was also done by Darwin Cook and Amanda Connor. That's Cook and Connor. That's pretty good, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I would agree. There's the track record of trying to bring Watchmen to life. Obviously, the 2009 Watchmen movie by Zack Snyder is the biggest instance of this. I think I've long said that it, one of my hottest takes <laughs> maybe is I, I, the way I said it recently was I never would have read Watchmen if not for 2009 Watchmen by Zack Snyder. You've now, said that before and it tears me up inside. <laughs> I think in retrospect, the never part of that is a little too hyperbolic because what I'm essentially saying is that movie was a really effective advertisement to me to go and check out this graphic novel. It's a really good commercial because I wasn't super into comics at the time, you know, yeah. and, and my knowledge of comics was mostly like Marvel DC stuff, and it got me outside that box. And then I read Watchmen as as a young person into like, you know, I was an English major. Like I was, I was reading James <laughs> Joyce and Nabokov, and I was like, oh, this is a comic book that is holding a candle to those. That's yeah. cool. The mere fact that it was listed as time 
uh, you know, magazine's 100 Greatest American Novels. I was like, mm-hmm. oh, this is legit. It had that air of this is legitimate literature that I didn't, at the time, no comics could approach. Now, now I look at it and it's like, yeah, I, I think a lot of comics do that. And and it's, you know, it's a medium that I absolutely love. Um, but for me, that was a big deal. So I'll admit to a curiosity and general excitement when Watchmen was teased in DC Rebirth, if some general skepticism that they, they being in this instance, Jeff Johns as the writer, storyteller, and apparent architect could bring it to life, I think. Um, But at the same time, like, there's always a pull for me because I love the 12-issue Watchmen series by Alan Moore, Dave Gibbons, and John Higgins, because I love it, even though I know there shouldn't be more. I know Alan Moore (laughs) has famously, famously said, I do not want there to be more of this. DC, he feels DC did him wrong in every regards, right? And, like, we're not going to go into the creator rights component of this, but Mm -hmm. I think there's, like, if you're looking into the creator rights and maybe just the ethics of it, we should not— we should not consume more Watchmen media and feel good about it. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? If you're looking at it through that lens, it's kind of hard. Sure. I guess my first reaction would be that I don't know that there... I'll, I'll have a hot take and say that I don't know that there should not be more Watchmen. Sure, yeah. Um, but we'll get into the specifics of my qualifiers there later. The one thing I would interrupt to say, however, is that there's a popular misconception that Moore's fallout with DC was over creator rights. Yeah, And if you go back to read his interviews uh, in 87 and 88 after he published Watchmen, it was actually based off of their new morality rules that were coming into play, Mm. um, which I think becomes a really interesting factor later on when we talk about adaptations, because that's really about who gets control, who gets to pick their own audience, um, what responsibility and respect that we give readers and that was Moore's original disagreement. His argument about creator rights didn't come up until, I think, the 90s. Because mm. the, the first interviews that I could find are all him talking about the, uh, the new morals and rating guides that DC and Marvel were both introducing at the time due to it being like the end of the Reagan era, beginning of the Bush se- uh, senior era, and that transfer yeah. period. That's a really good point, and it brings up a point that I I meant to drop at the top of this, which is Watchmen, Watchmen Watchmen-related material, deals with some pretty sensitive graphic issues, I think. Mm -hmm. So as far as content goes, I think, like, we're going, you know, typically comp apparel conversations, we approach these in a a pretty friendly, all-ages manner. Um, I think we are (laughs) going to continue to do so. That said, there are some pretty sensitive adult themes that may not be appropriate for some audiences um, and, and may not be things that you necessarily want to listen to so be be forewarned this is a comic and it definitely that's a big part of Watchmen's legacy I think in a lot of ways is it is for better or for worse that the one of the tipping points for like grim and gritty comics right so what we think of now is like the serious maturation of the medium you know Dark Knight Returns Watchmen Sandman a little bit later right these are all books that are like you can talk about adult things well that has meant for some creators like, oh, that means that all of crime, you know, in its in all its glory can be discussed in the comic book page and not all comics are prepared to do that well. Right. So that's that's a part of Watchmen's legacy as well. I think let's get to then the next question. We were both we both saw the the comedian button in the Batcave. We were both like, ah, OK, where are we going here? It raises yeah. the bigger question. Can comics end? And should they end, right? So you already kind of started talking here about you actually don't necessarily think Watchmen, there shouldn't be more Watchmen. Because I I think my initial take would just be Watchmen is my favorite comic of all time. 12 issues are as good as I think the comics medium can do, right? If I'm going to rank it first, I'm saying they are a near perfect 12 issues. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely... But they're very, like, should there... The idea of a sequel has almost become a running gag, you know? You know, like the idea of Watchmen 2, at least is from 2011 until now, is kind of like kind of a joke. Like, why would you do that? You don't need a sequel. Should should Watchmen have ended? What's your opinion here? Uh, so I think that Alan Moore's Watchmen should have ended, to which I mean, like, I think they should have closed the book on Dr. Manhattan, Rorschach, Nadal, Silk Spectre, Ozymandias, the whole group. Yeah. But... 
I like the idea of Watchmen being an almost imprint to work under. Okay. Where people can riff on some of the approaches that Moore was taking. Um, they can spend more of their time making this deeply considered high quality piece. Uh, that's definitely what uh, Moore and Gibbons did. Yeah. I I think that a lot of the places where Watchmen, I don't know, what do we want to call them? Interpretations or sequels or whatever comes after. Anybody who did Watchmen that wasn't Alan Moore, uh, I think a lot of that falls apart by trying either to rely too heavily on what he did or by not the time to understand why his stuff worked, which was not necessarily the character's. Mm -hmm. As for the other question about can they end or should they end, you know, definitely I, I personally believe that some comics should be allowed to end. Yeah. I think that it should be all right to be able to say, like, this is this is as good as this is getting or, like, we are ending on a really strong note. Let's not open it back up. Yeah. But I don't think they can end, um, not in terms of DC or Marvel comics anyways. I think that there will always be a forced issue in – keeping these things printing money yeah i don't think there's an intellectual property has become a buzzword mm -hmm. in media conversation yeah. over the last however many years and i think a lot, you know probably the most famous example is star wars you know yeah. it's just like yeah if something is big enough and something has a large enough fan base it's coming back and that is just the reality of entertainment as we know it in this cultural moment so it's not surprising that DC would be like, we're bringing Watchmen back. Honestly, the more surprising part is that they waited as long as they did. <laughs> like, they actually made it until more or less, you know, if we count the movie 2009, if we count before Watchmen 2011, I don't want to slap them too hard on the back here, but, like, that's actually a good run of not bringing it back. Yeah, it's so, over 20 years. Yeah, so I, I tend to agree that, like, it's not inherently bothersome to me this idea of bringing it back. And I think what we're talking about when we look at Doomsday Clock and HBO Watchmen is it just, it so much comes down to the approach, mm -hmm. the ideas and the reverence towards, towards this, this thing that more Gibbons and Higgins created because Doomsday Clock, I think I'll just cats out of the bag here. I think misses a lot. HBO Watchmen I'm watching and I'm exhilarated. I'm yeah. watching this like, oh, they got it. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe they got it. And that is, um, like, tremendously exciting. So I'd be lying if I said, nope, close the door. Nobody should touch this. I don't feel that way. Yeah, and no. I think, I think honestly, like, as a comic book fan, it would be hard for me to make that case for almost anything because uh, the superhero medium that I love is all about not doing that, is all about yeah. Spider-Man will exist and has existed since 1962, 63. Mm -hmm. and, and people are just going to keep telling stories and keep being the caretaker of this of this character, even if it's not good. So to me, it's just like such an inherent part of the, gen like the genre. Yeah. And Watchmen is superhero genre as much as it deconstructs it. Um, it just, I don't know, it just like makes sense. That's how I, that's how I enjoy this entertainment. So I think with Star Wars, the one thing you see is, and the thing that Disney recently realized is less is more a lot mm -hmm. of times. There is in there's a danger to overexposure, and that's my biggest hope here with Watchmen, is less is more. Yeah. If you're gonna do them, it's a big deal. You know, yeah. it's a big moment. Um, even if it doesn't work, it needs to be a big moment. If we see next year, DC's got a line of Rorschach, Night Owl, Silk Spectre ongoings, <laughs> and a, a Rorschach Batman team up comic, that's gonna be really bad. <laughs> that's gotta be coming though. That's gotta be coming. That that I don't like the idea of. And I don't think it's just me being old man, get off my lawn. <laughs> like, I think that is destined to fail. I really do. Well, yeah, I mean, Moore's comic, you know, Moore's original 12 issues. Um, I don't know that they're necessarily a deconstruction, deconstruction, but that's a literary nerd argument we can have at another time. Uh, I think that it's, I think I agree know, with you, for the record. Yeah, well, good. Um, I think it's the issue that... Moore was making a commentary in a lot of ways about where comics were at at the time. Yeah. And I think that's part of why it needed to end because that was part of the statement. You know, that the the whole package was considered. Let's start with I want to start with the positives. Okay. Because I think, you know, you and I were talking about this uh, a little before we started and there's an inherent 
there's an inherent obviousness to discussing Doomsday Clock in terms of saying, like, well, is it as good as Watchmen? And that is a bar <laughs> that we yeah. should not be holding Doomsday Clock to. It no. does not make sense to do so, and it only is going to bring negativity into, like, obvious negativity, uninteresting negativity in a yeah. conversation. So what I want to talk about first is what does Doomsday Clock do well? What do we like? And for those who are coming in fresh, Doomsday Clock, it's a 12-issue series <laughs> that has taken forever to come out. Uh, yeah. written by Jeff Johns with art by Gary Frank. And it's, uh, it's, it's DC's sequel to Watchmen in which they bring the DC universe and the Watchmen universe together, right? That is the premise, is basically looking at um, the situation where the Watchmen characters are traveling to mm -hmm. the DC universe. What does it do well? So I'll let you start. I have uh, a couple things that I actually really like, but what are, what are your takes on like where this comic succeeds? I think that, you know, Jeff Johns does his, his usual great job of finding interesting hooks and interesting um, visual metaphors from within the Watchmen story to bring over the DC universe. Uh, for example, it's a small moment, but I really liked how he treated um, the new Rorschach's hallucinations while he was in Arkham. Yeah. That felt really good because it's a cross between, you know, uh, a Moore's influence, but then the traditional DC influence on how he's kind of working it out, showing him, imagining the squid's eye on the doctor's head. Yeah. That's that's a good blending of the worlds there. Um, man, beyond that, though, like, it's it gets tricky. He does... I think Johns does the best job possible of doing an impossible task. <laughs> the idea of... Yeah, right. Because it, if I had to... You and I were talking about this earlier, about, like, what was the purpose behind Doomsday Clock? And my argument off the air was that I think it was just a business plan. It was just how do we get Watchmen characters into DC continuity? Right. How do we get Manhattan to meet Superman, which fans want? How do we get Rorschach to meet Batman that fans want? Yeah. Um, I, I think that was literally the directive that they gave him. And Johns has done, like, if we judge it on that grounds... Johns has done, you know, an all right job of saying, okay, we're going to make this a, an event so that we can wrap as many DC characters around as many Watchmen characters as possible to entangle them. Yes. You know, I, I think that that was, that was a good plan. Um, so, so I want to, I want to spin off that before I say mm -hmm. what I liked, because that is very much aligned with, with some thoughts I had, which is to say there's a really strange pull to Doomsday Clock, both trying to operate as a Watchmen sequel, which is an insanely mm -hmm. ambitious undertaking, right? Yeah. And you're, like you said, it's the impossible job. Yeah. And as the driving in-universe, in-continuity DC Universe event. Like, yeah. this is a classic DC event-style yeah. structure, and this will be taken as more of an insult than I probably intend. Um, th actually, definitely, it's, it's not intended as an insult. Doomsday Clock belongs more in a conversation with Infinite Crisis than it does with Watchmen. Yes, it is, correct. It is a way more similar comic. 100%. Yeah, with, with the Jeff Johns written Infinite Crisis, which I really like, actually. I like Infinite Crisis, especially in the context of the tie-ins around it and some of yeah. the interesting things that, like, Greg Rucka was doing with Omax. And, you know, it's all kind of besides the point. But, like, that's a very 2006, here's what the DC Universe is statement, right? Mm -hmm. And playing with the past and the continuity of DC. That's what Doomsday Clock is doing. And there's a yeah. part of me... That would have rather seen this book fleshed out in like Dark Knight's metal tie-in event scale, like yeah. twenty tie-ins around it that actually yeah. just say like we're just gonna do this like the normal DC event instead of saying here's the twelve standalone definitive Watchmen sequel issues because yeah. it doesn't work that way. Well, it's no, but they did that because Watchmen was twelve issues, just like they did I, the yeah. they tried to do the nine panel grid that Johns doesn't really appear to know how to work with. Um, at the least not as well as grid, it, There's a much bigger conversation around it, I think, honestly, just as, like, a comics craft thing, because mm -hmm. that's so much of Tom King's rise to yeah. prominence, honestly, and, and yeah. he uses it at times brilliantly. I think both yeah. of us have talked about Mr. Miracle. Is oh, gonna God, be, it's yeah. going to go down as one of our absolute favorite comics of the decade, you know? It's been some debate about where. <laughs> <laughs> on that list it's going to be. I will work <laughs> you down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Um, but like the nine panel grid is there that formalism and that mm-hmm. Watchmen like craft bit about how to yeah. make a comic in that style. It's weighing Frank's and John's down. They can't seem to shake it, and it's just yeah. like not everyone works that way. Not every story no. works that way, and they're trying no. to do it only not because the story demands it, but because Watchmen yeah. did it. And you can yeah, feel exactly. that, you know. Yeah, and it's I like totally you're, you're being that. pulled by Adrian Veidt's nostalgia. <laughs> you're not being pulled down by your own storytelling directions. Did right. I did I say that right? I've been saying it wrong for years. I realized on HBO Watchmen. No, you know? it's Veidt. Yeah, Adrian. Yeah, Veidt. I, I've been saying Veidt. I think forever. Well, I think in the motion comic that DC put out, it was Veidt. Okay, which is very funny. Yeah, but uh, it it probably should be Veidt. Just because I think it's Germanic in origin. It's ger- yeah, he's German. His parents are German. Um, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're German immigrants, I think. So, all right. So, that was... Th- I'm glad you said that because that was definitely something I want to get to. I think in terms of what I think Doomsday Clock does well, what do I like? Um, first thing, <laughs> Jeff Johns introduced me to Nathaniel Dusk, which is a miniseries written by Don McGregor and uh, with art by Gene Colan in the 1980s for DC. Did you know this? Did you know about this book? No. So, the movie... The adjournment is mm-hmm. in Watchmen. There's the Black Freighter comic, yeah. which is a story within a story, which is like sure. my all time favorite comics trope. Right. <laughs> like I love stories within stories. And <laughs> uh, and he's doing it here with the adjournment, which is a Nathaniel Dusk private eye thing. I assume mm-hmm. that was a doomsday clock creation. It is not. That's actually a McGregor and Colin uh, miniseries that they wrote for DC. Huh. So that's one of the things that Johns is. He's famously... A, a DC continuity buff, you know? Yeah. He pulls that from actual DC Comics history. That's really cool. That's a really nice is... touch. And uh, and the only reason I knew that, or the only reason I found it out, is because at one point he lists the director of the movie as Don McGregor. And I'm like, that's... Mm-hmm. I, Don McGregor wrote Panther's Rage, the amazing yeah. Black Panther comics. I'm like, that's too big of a coincidence, so I looked it up, and that's how <laughs> I figured it out. So that's a nice, nice in-universe nod. Um... A couple. Oh, and the other thing is like I do generally like one of the biggest reveals in Doomsday Clock comes in issue ten, and uh, this is when Johns finally delivers on what his Doctor Manhattan been doing, right? right? So the big the big hook in DC Rebirth Universe is at the end of the issue, there's been this blue hand, you know, that has sort of been guiding the DC universe, and and everyone's immediate assumption is oh that's probably Doctor Manhattan. Well, turns out mm-hmm. it was Doctor Manhattan. We were right all along. <laughs> And in issue number 10, it takes a long time to get there, but in issue number 10, Mm -hmm. we see him explain what he's been doing. And this is where Johns unveils the concept of the metaverse, okay? So there's a a multiverse. In Marvel, we've Mm -hmm. got an omniverse, which is a collection of multiverses. And now we have, in DC, the metaverse. Mm -hmm. This whole concept is very up my alley because (laughs) it's, it's Johns as that DC historian trying to explain the publisher side of business through in-universe narratives. Yeah, you're, that's a good point. I I kind of discounted that at first because I have some issues with the execution, but as, yeah. you're right, as an idea, that's really good. Especially since uh, DC put the kibosh on the multiverse after Flashpoint, I think? I think that's right. Well, the multiverse is around. No, Dan Didio canceled it. Unless it's been renewed since he canceled it. So... I mean, I th- I think that multiversity <laughs> gives us our fifty two world well done our fifty two world map, and in Dark Knight's Metal we get the inverse of the multiverse because mm-hmm. if you turn the map over, <laughs> there's mm-hmm. fifty two dark worlds. That's cool. <laughs> so there there are these. I think what it is is now it's it's um defined okay. instead of the Marvel Marvel's multiverse is forever. Yeah, there's just no infinite. limit. DC's multiverse. Sure unless they've changed this recently, is is 52 positive, 52 negative Earths. I think that still okay. stands, post-New okay. 52 at least. Um, but long story short, with the metaverse, this is Dr. Manhattan saying, like, well, Superman's been born a bunch of times throughout history, specifically mm-hmm. 1939 and, like, 1986, for example, right? Yeah. And there's different origin stories. And what we know as Superman fans is, well, he was created— by Joe Simon and Juice Schuster in uh, mm-hmm. in 1939, and then post Crisis on Infinite Earths, you know John Byrne got to retell the the origins of Superman and Man of Steel, and Doctor Manhattan's basically saying like, 
these different moments are part of the metaverse and that right. all of these different Superman retellings throughout history, basically it's basically it's kind of the Grant Morrison thing with Batman where he's like, everything happened. Everything mm-hmm. that you know in Batman history happened and I'm just going to mash it all together. Johns yeah. is doing that, but he's giving it a name. He's giving yeah. it a name and he's saying like, it happened and here's how. It happened because Dr. Manhattan is like, you know, traveling and pulling strings and, and always has been kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's very high minded, like, you know, crazy, like how does how does DC time add up? Um <laughs> right. but it's it's kind of fun to think about because I like the idea of all of DC history mattering and counting, and this mm-hmm. is the way that they do it, is through this. Yeah, that's right up your alley. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so I think that stuff's pretty I don't know that it's well done, but it is definitely <laughs> well thought out. It's I I like it as a concept, I really do. And I think if the book it had a little bit more time to play with that. I think Johns would have done a great job. Yeah, you know, he's his expansion of the Speed Force uh, is directly indicative of what he could have done here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe he still will after uh, after Doomsday Clock ends. Maybe he'll come back and he'll flesh these things out or something. But then again, he does have a habit of leaving dangling plot threads. So yeah, like we still don't know why exactly the comedian is alive. Other than I'm sure that DC wanted the IP, is we wanted yeah, is we wanted a comedian in the story, right? It's yeah. like that that could have been a lot of people, and so yeah, okay. I don't want to get to it yet. <laughs> so okay, so those are the things I think we liked about Doomsday Clock, and I think obviously you can tell at this point from the the way we're talking about this that it's a little bit harder to come up with the stuff that we think is really working because this comic mm-hmm. is kind of a mess, yeah. and it doesn't, it definitely does not live up to the standards that it set for itself, frankly. Um, I think both you and I would say, like, generally positive feelings about Jeff Johns as a writer and a creator. Yeah. Um, I I really like his Green Lantern work. That was some of, like, the formative DC comics for me, getting into, getting into comics. That said, I think there's... The idea of a response to Watchmen is very exciting to me. That's very up my yeah. alley. And you have... Plenty of examples. There's the, the reason I held up Multiversity is because I actually just read Pax Americana, Grant Morrison and Frank Whiteley story within that. That is a a riff on what if Morgan Gibbons pitched Watchmen in 2019, right? That's a response to Watchmen. There's a book this year, 2019, Kieran Gillen and Peter Wingard delivered one that I raved about in our Best Comics 2019 podcast, uh, Peter Kane of Thunderbolt. That's five issues saying we need to move on. Beyond yeah. Watchmen, but also riffing on it at the same time, right? So there's the idea of these responses. The idea of a writer so wholly known for superhero comics writing giving the superhero response to mm-hmm. Watchmen, and that's Jeff Johns, is is at least full of potential, you know? Mm-hmm. And in interviews, Johns has been saying, like, I, I was imagining Dr. Manhattan and Superman talking about their different philosophies, and presumably that's what issue 12 is going to be, right? We haven't actually yeah. the conclusion yet. Um this is one of the biggest letdowns of the of the issue to me is instead of John's leaning into his strengths and being like, mm-hmm. I'm a superhero guy. I'm going to write a superhero comic explaining or responding to Watchmen's sort of, right. again, like we said, famous deconstruction. I think ultimately you and I are like, uh, actually, it's not. It's still a superhero yeah. story, I think, at the end of sure. the day. Um, he's doing an Alan Moore impersonation more than anything. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I... A lot of that is true, but then stuff falls out, and I don't know what he's doing. I don't think it's a particularly uh, convincing impersonation. No. Man, I love John's uh, ability to craft a story. I love his ability to zoom in on, like, particular parts of it. Uh, you know, specifically, he usually he usually dives into a theme, a single theme in a book, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then makes every last part of it revolve around that theme. So... Green Lantern was all about overcoming fear. Um, the Flash, his run on The Flash was all about how the fastest man in the world needs to slow down and enjoy life. Yeah. Um, you know, the Justice Society America was all about family. There's, I, I can't remember what, oh, Aquaman was fish out of water. When he falls apart, it's when he ditches that basis as a theme. Yeah. Uh, which happened in his Justice League run and is happening in spades right now because... I don't know what we are. Eleven issues out of twelve in, and I'm not certain what the theme is. I think I think neither of us know what Doomsday Clock is trying to do. Like you, like you said, 
aside from bringing Watchmen in, yeah, what is it trying to do? And and this is what I was talking about as it as letting it operate as an Infinite Crisis style event would have made more sense. Is it's also trying to be that in universe like big game changing event. Yeah. But it but it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit with anything else happening in DC Comics. You nope. know, it's like it's it's running in parallel to mm-hmm. You're the Villain Justice League. It's running in parallel to Heroes in Crisis, which gets referenced in this. Yeah. It doesn't add up. And No, I, hilariously, it's almost its own pocket universe the way that Watchmen was. Totally. And I can't think that that's intentional. That has just to be because of how long it's taken to come out yeah. that writers have just abandoned it. Yeah, I think that's that's one of the biggest problems is the timing for this book was like six months after Rebirth, mm-hmm. you know, and instead they waited, I mean, what, at least a year, maybe yeah. longer, you know, and then the book itself has taken several years to come out. So one thing that I always find kind of, I don't know, I'm not sure it holds water is like when people are critiquing a book a decade later and mm-hmm. it's like, oh, well, the book took forever to come out and that clouds my judgment of it. It doesn't matter to somebody reading it a decade later. Yeah, you know what I mean? No. Like when you're reading it on DC Universe and you're binging it all at once or whatever the heck right. this thing's going to be called, you know, HBO Universe in 10 years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like it doesn't matter to you. But in the moment, the publication cadence has mattered a lot, I think. So oh, yeah. let's let's from there look at the, the TV show a little bit more because I okay. think it colors a little bit about this idea of what is Watchmen supposed to be if Doomsday Clock isn't it. And mm-hmm. I think we're both kind of in agreement that it's not. You know, it's it's a it's a muddled attempt to merge Watchmen and DC characters, mm-hmm. and it's kind of it's try it's trying to do it in the more Gibbons Higgins style, and it's all kind of just in the middle. It's all kind of yeah. in the middle of the road. We're not totally sure what the the questions are. Honestly, like the whole idea around the Superman theory is the hook of like the arms race in this one, and why are all mm-hmm. super powered people American? Right. It's not an interesting hook to me, and it just it kind of falls apart, honestly. It, it could have been, but up against the scale of how many heroes are involved and now two universes are involved, it doesn't hold up to that. Yeah. You know, if they had zeroed in on that as a theme, on American exceptionalism, let's say, as a sure. theme, I think they could have done something with it. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't understand what they're doing right now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's... I guess the only other thing that I would say to close off Jeff Johns is that while I do love him as uh, a storyteller, he's, you know, incredibly literal. And I don't quite understand why he was picked for this book because he really, he doesn't have the poetry in his soul that uh, uh, Alan Moore or Grant Morrison or a Neil Gaiman or somebody from that ilk does. Yeah. So it feels like just such a tonal mismatch trying to make him write you know an alan moore story that's that's why i think the the impersonation thing is such a mistake yeah because that is not john's strength that's yeah. not what he does so plus it misses the point of watchman entirely yeah like the and, actual book right and and right exactly to come in and just say oh we're just going to do it again i the, mm-hmm. also there if i'm gonna like really get on him with a criticism the arrogance the ego to step in and think, oh, I can just do, I can just do more. <laughs> right? It, it's It'll be crazy. fine. It's crazy. Like there's nothing, there's nothing in your your catalog, which no. is deep, which runs yeah. to oh, you yeah. know twenty years, and it, it many is often very good. Many Eisners, exactly. There's nothing in there that suggests you can write an Alan Moore, no. Dave Gibbons, Higgins comic. You know, so no. like the arrogance there to step in and think you can do that is. It's bewildering. I don't know why why that would be the thought. And yeah, it doesn't. It hasn't happened. And again, like we haven't read the twelfth issue. It's a little bit like Heroes in Crisis. I, I think to me, where it's like after issue eight, people are like, well, wait and see how it ends on issue nine. It doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah, there's matter no at this point. Left. The experience. There's no runway, right? Like you've run. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You've run out of room to make this a win. And, yeah. and issue 11 already is starting to just cram in last-minute information, it feels 11 like. 11 was an exposition comic. Yeah. 11 was, here's what's happened so far. Oh, and a please so creep long. reading at the end. Oh, my like gosh. Like, those last two pages are just like, please buy the next one. I, I think 11 yeah. was the worst issue of yeah. the bunch. You know, yeah. I definitely, like... Okay. Okay. You, yeah. we, you've, you've heard us. <laughs> <laughs> you know we don't love Doomsday yeah. Clock. 
I wouldn't say I hate it. I just think it's no. kind of a letdown, especially when you think consider the standards. You've set the standard for yourself, and it's it's falling very very short, right? Uh, I think the best way to, for me to say it would be that I'm frustrated by it. Yeah, because it could have been, it could have been anything else, and it wasn't. Yeah, sure. So that that gets to me between Doomsday Clock and HBO Watchmen. You have two creative teams with the what I think is like the exact same idea. And they have completely varied levels of execution. So mm -hmm. HBO Watchmen makes it makes following up Watchmen look like a great idea. I think mm -hmm. so far. We, again, we've watched three issue three episodes, and I've, like I said, been completely blown away at their ability to tell a Watchmen sequel. Yeah. Doomsday Clock, on the other hand, feels like the proof that DC Comics should have left this work the hell alone. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. By the time I got into comic books, like I said, the idea of a Watchmen sequel was a running gag. Have you ever read Chip Zdarsky's pitch for Watchmen 2? He wrote this. It was published on like Warren Ellis's website in the early 2010s. Do you know what I'm talking no, about? No, but now I need to. I love Chip Zdarsky. I have to put this in the show notes then. I have to track this down Please. because it's hilarious. And it also is like the perfect encapsulation of, of the idea of following up Watchmen just by like upping the ante. So one of mm -hmm. Chip's hooks is like, ooh, in the in the first one, Doctor Manhattan had full frontal nudity. So guess what? We're gonna get we're gonna get backside nudity, <laughs> 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 and it's like grotesque drawings of Doctor Manhattan. Oh but... <laughs> no! Oh, it's, Chip, it's not why? what you want to see, but it's simultaneously perfect. Um, yeah. So okay. So given that context, HBO Watchmen, Damon Lindelof, and, and the entire crew step in, and they say the same thing as Doomsday Clock. Amazingly, like yeah. we're gonna do a sequel. We're just going to do X years later in the in the Watchmen universe, but it's mm -hmm. working. It's working so yeah. well. I have two questions here. Mm -hmm. Why why is this working better as a response, as a follow up, and then two, does the medium actually help? Does is it, it the I feel like a comic sequel to Watchmen mm -hmm. playing in the same ballpark? playing on yeah. Warren Gibbons and Higgins terms is an impossible job and yeah. TV's feeling it making it feel like it's not an impossible job do you think there's something to that or is it just because the story's good well let's start with the second question first I think that the change in medium you bring up that's a really that's a really good idea because yeah we do interpret it differently mm -hmm. if I don't know necessarily that like the the venue of television is doing it great favors yeah but you're right in that it's a completely different thing. We are more free to to judge it as its own thing. Yeah. Um, I think that's absolutely right. And actually, no, maybe... I think television does change it because uh, there's a lot of stuff that more writes that you just can't have a human say out loud. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, where people don't talk that way, no matter how beautiful it is on page. Sure. Um, so I think definitely, yeah... The, the medium helps in that way. Um, I'm sorry, the cold medication is catching me. What was the first question? <laughs> no worries, no worries. You know, the, the other piece with the medium that I actually think, because, mm. like, my one thought was, it like, okay, because I kind of came to that revelation. I'm like, oh, I think, it's, I think the medium is actually helping it a ton because it's just, like, mm -hmm. I'm watching it on TV as opposed to, like, I'm used to judging it as a comic. And yeah. I judge a lot of comics now, <laughs> right? Like, that's how I spend yeah. a lot of my time. <laughs> but I don't judge as much TV. So I think that helps. But then you think about, like, the 2009 movie, and it's like, well, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a de facto win just to move the medium, right? So I, mm -hmm. I do think it's important to delineate, like, just because it's off of the page doesn't mean it's going to be better. In this no. instance, though, you take it the creativity and the approach, it helps. Exactly. Yeah. Um, even something like the, the Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross score. It's like that's yeah. something you can't get in the comic medium, even though Alan Moore has done inventive things with music and comics. Sure. You can't get that same vibe. Like the thrill I get every time they punch those those tracks in when uh when Regina King's character is putting on the sister. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness, you can't get that in a comic. So <laughs> that stuff's amazing. Um the first part of the question was effectively what is HBO Watchmen doing? Why do we think it's working? Why do we think it's working as a sequel where Doomsday Clock does not? So for me, um, and thank you for reminding me, for me, the, uh, it's working because the, someone involved, uh, either, you know, Damon Lidloff or the, the script writers, I don't know who, someone took the time to pick apart Watchmen 
yeah. and said, what do people actually like about this? Why yeah. does this thing work? And it was brave enough to introduce new characters, new plot ideas, stuff that's not just purely referential mm-hmm. to the source material. Yep. Um, I think, you know, to your point, Doomsday Clock kind of fall apart, you know, fell apart rather, uh, because it was so relying on these tricks. You know, uh, the, the Carver Coleman Black, uh, Black Freighter, the issue four of Doomsday Clock is just the Abyss Gazes also, the Rorschach in jail from the original run. Issue seven is the Watchmaker Sun, etc. Yeah, um, you know it's just these kind of rehashes. Well, this this television series went through and said, okay, so we want to do social commentary. We want that commentary to feel dangerous, right? Uh, and we want to, you know, kind of z- zero in on the characters themselves and follow them tightly rather than just following an event as it's unfolding. Yeah. Uh, I think that all of those are tremendously successful. I I have some some misgivings about other parts, but you know, by focusing in on the uh, the issue of racial injustice, they've really made that show topical the way that Watchmen was topical. Right, and it's kind of talking about something that we're very bad about talking about, just like Watchmen was. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. I think that's a great way to say it. I also think one of the biggest differences between the two mm-hmm. is there's a wonder and mystery to the TV show mm. mirrored against the absolute lack of mystery in Doomsday Clock. Like, yeah. the TV show is saying it's it's a very rewarding experience to have read Watchmen, and especially, like, I just reread it. Having okay. just reread it and watching the show, I'm getting a lot more out of it. The references mm-hmm. are tighter, the Easter eggs are closer, but they're also, like, they're relevant. They're not just, like, I mean, there are Easter eggs, of course, that are just fun little, like, oh, there's sure. uh, Flight of the Valkyries in the background or something, but, like, <laughs> or Ride of the Valkyries. Um, but, like, there's also, like, oh, Lori Blake shows up, and she's going by Blake. And, yeah. and then you read, have you read the back matter for the, the Watchmen series? This Pedipedia thing? No. Oh, my gosh. Go to the go to the HBO Watchmen website, and they've got this mm-hmm. thing called Pedipedia. And there are these FBI files, and they're doing the the back matter stuff that Watchmen did in each issue. They would have, okay. you know, um, excerpts from Hollis Macy's Minutemen, right? Yeah. But in this, they're doing, okay, this episode, here's uh, the legal case for reparations that was made in this Watchmen universe. and Or here's a clip explaining, a memo explaining the FBI's approach to declaring Adrian Vate dead. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. It adds so much detail to the world. Mm. And it's like having just reread it, I'm getting so much more out of it. And one thing I realized is there's the the entertainment has to has to convince you to want to read that stuff. So yeah. in Watchmen, the back matter is like, yes, I want more. And mm-hmm. after you read that first excerpt, you're like, oh, this is Alan Moore is fully committed to making this excellent, even like like Night Owl's, um, what is it, ornithology journal entry on birds. It's like, you know how many ornithology journals I've read in my life, John? <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty small number. Yeah, and I want to read it every time I get mm-hmm. to it. The show's doing the same thing, and then it's offering this PDPedia thing that I found recently is like as much fun, and then Doomsday Clock has back matter. And every time I get mm-hmm. to it, especially as the series progressed, I was less and less interested Yeah, in actually reading them. It was just like, it's not winning me over. There's not mystery to this that I want. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm hungry for details. I'm hungry for the world building and learning more about this place that I don't quite understand, that is familiar mm-hmm. yet different. Doomsday Clock doesn't have that magic. And I think yeah. so much of it is because the mystery that was teased in 2016... Mm-hmm. The answer's been right there all along. It's just yeah. like, oh, is it Dr. Manhattan? Yes, it's Dr. Manhattan. How is it Dr. Manhattan? Well, issue 10 kind of goes into it a little bit more, but, like, there's nothing more to it than that. Really? Yeah. Well, it's it's also the fact that wrapping something as familiar as the DC continuity around Watchmen takes a lot of the mystery out of it. Yeah. You know, that's, that's unfortunate, but true. Yeah. So, I... I would totally agree with you that the the HBO Watchmen series has been surprising, I would yeah. say. Surprisingly kind of special. 
Um, mm-hmm. And I and I've also just been surprised by like, I, you actually said before we started recording, there's a chance that they had read some of Doomsday Clock before putting HBO Watchmen together because mm-hmm. there. But otherwise, though, it's just like there are. It's fascinating to me the idea that they didn't, and that Lindelof cues everyone writing everyone involved they came to some of the same conclusions but in such Mm -hmm. but then executed in such different ways as like johns and frank on doomsday clock because you know for example they're both like well rorschach obviously is the pov character here right in in watching doomsday clock decides well that means we're going to introduce a new rorschach and (laughs) actually we're going to we are going to kind of respond to the ultra conservative potentially um, Rorschach is not a hero no, in Watchmen, no. right? And I think that's a big misconception. It's one of the biggest things that both are playing with. Doomsday Clock's answer to that is we're going to make him the victim, the victimized son of Rorschach's mm-hmm. psychologist, and also he's going to be African-American, which takes yeah. a lot of that like neocon potential racism that like maybe isn't too explicit with Rorschach, but is explicit in the New Frontiersman paper that he's obsessed with. You know what mm. I mean? Like at a minimum, that's the media he's consuming. Um, it takes that and it puts it, but it puts it in very just like, well, our answer is to make him African American. That's it. Yeah, it doesn't get explored more than that. Well, HBO Watchmen. That's the whole. That's the hook. That's yeah. the show so far. Which which makes so much more sense and works so much better because uh, it's it's difficult to say why this is an issue, but. I don't know that making first of all making a new Rorschach is is fraught with problems to begin with. Yeah. But the idea that merely changing his race somehow fixes a problem with the book that's just that's just the wrong idea because it doesn't understand, you know, the purpose of Rorschach's character who, you know, for those who don't know, more created Rorschach as a way of satirizing and lampooning the ultra dark and highly violent and conservative characters of um, Frank Miller. Like mm. that's Rorschach is not only not supposed to be a, a hero, but he's supposed to be disliked. So he's also I don't, based on, he's also based on the famously objectivist Ayn Randian Steve Ditko question character, right? That's true. Yeah. So like there's a, there's an additional degree of lampooning there. You know, I will, I will say too, reading Watchmen again, I do like Rorschach. <laughs> like that's the that's the trick to him mm-hmm. is it's a it's a satirization, but then like maybe maybe likes the wrong word. I feel sympathy for him by the end. You know, like I do feel bad for him, and that's kind of an amazing trick. Yeah, in Watchmen because I don't know that you're supposed to. I guess it's because we're in his head so much. Yeah, it's um, the protagonist problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But some of it too is like they take when they take his face when the police beat him up, you know, mm-hmm. and it's like he's so he's so lost without it. He's so broken, and he's wearing um he's wearing elevated shoes because yeah. he wants to be seen as taller. And like that one, that part always is just like, oh man, this this poor guy, even though he's got some really messed up <laughs> world views, yeah. right? Um, anyway, you were saying. Changing his his ethnicity didn't do a whole lot. It didn't add a new dimension to the character. Mm-hmm. In the way that Regina King in the HBO show adds a whole new dimension to the world. Yeah, right. you know it 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 breaks things wide open, um, which for obvious reasons I don't think Johns could have done in the in the space allotted to him in the twelve issue, uh, twelve issue Doomsday Clock. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, I have been, there's been some work in that show that on, um, on racial injustice that I've absolutely loved. I love that they brought in Bass Reeves, both because that's, you know, a spectacular story. Uh, he was the U.S. Marshal who they, uh, highlighted in episode two. Um, but also because that, that inclusion of Bass Reeves sort of feels like an Alan Mooreism without it being a literal Alan Mooreism. There you go. You yeah. know, it's right. a it's a tonal reference or a feel reference as opposed to, you know, hey, we're going to add in um, you know, more Adrian Veidt company stuff, corporate stuff like Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a nice way to put it is 
taking the spirit of Moore's research as mm-hmm. opposed to literal textual references, which is a lot of what Doomsday Clock is. You know, and that's yeah. that's like you said, like Jeff Johns is famously probably like the most literal comic book creator I've ever I've ever encountered. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like he's like his whole like Green Lantern hook, which I love, is just like, oh, there's green, so there must be other colors. <laughs> yeah. Right? So we'll expand right. the spectrum, which actually I think is based on an Alan Moore idea. There's something in the there's something in his Green Lantern run that is definitely based on one of the few Green Lantern um more comics and I'm I'm spacing mm. on what it is now cuz it's not the F sharp bell. But no. anyway, that's neither here nor there. He's so literal. And that his textual reference is like, "Oh, Dr. Manhattan said he's going to another galaxy at the end of Watchmen." And he right. hits that beat several times. And then yeah. that's literally what happens, right? Is like, "Oh, well that's the DC universe." And I, right. I on one hand I kind of appreciate that as the way to get mm-hmm. from point A to point B, but it's also it's not adding mystery and wonder. In the way that yeah. Watchmen makes me, like you said, like Bass Reeves, the Tulsa Massacre, it's historical yeah. and 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 devastating and mm-hmm. real and real and like it hits with a a world building, a tonal yeah. world build that is like I need to know more about this place because it's both somewhere I live and somewhere totally mysterious to me. Yeah, and I love uh, when you bring up the Tulsa mass- Massacre. Not only is that a spectacular story that people really should know, um, and it it definitely is that, but also it's such an interesting twist on the reference material because where Watchmen ends with this gigantic bloody massacre and a town being destroyed, mm-hmm. that's how the new Watchmen on HBO begins. Yeah. yeah, you know that's a nice little little sympathy between the two that was smart just from a structural standpoint. Yeah, yeah, right. No, it makes it feel like a, a continuation. Like like that's mm-hmm. a more that's a very more Watchmen trick, is you say, um, you know, the the person ends the bottom right panel with "we need to turn a corner," and on mm-hmm. panel one, the next page, someone's literally turning a corner, right? So yeah, it's exactly. that like, okay, the beat is violence, and violence mm-hmm. continues. Violence begets violence, right? But it's a different yeah. different context. So, all right, I think all that is to say what gets us to kind of like the the question that we were we were using as a through line. For this conversation, which is what is Watchmen to you, John? This is a question that you asked me, and the the criteria you put on this was in as few words as possible, without mentioning the creators, characters, or plot. What is Watchmen to you? So mm-hmm. let's answer this now, having discussed in our in our fashion, Doomsday Clock and HBO Watchmen. So I'm going to start if you don't mind. Sure. Man. Until recently, I asked you the question. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've thought about it definitely, and until <laughs> recently, I would have said. I would have thought about it more in terms of ambition in the comic book medium. Mm-hmm. So like Watchmen is a statement about what comic books can be occupying pop culture and literary grandeur in the same moment. The problem I have with this approach now is it feels like Watchmen is consistently reduced to its formalism. I feel yeah. like it's been overly reduced to craft, like it's mostly a feat of comic book craft rather mm-hmm. than a story. And but and when I say mostly, it's kind of a straw man argument, but I feel like critically, that is a lot of what I see now, is it's mm-hmm. reduced to nine-panel grid, incredible use of color and approach, mm-hmm. and like I said, those little, those little more tricks of, you know, the Black Freighter text is discussing something that mirrors what the newspaper salesman is saying on the same page, right? Like all those yeah. tonal craft tricks that... I think Watchmen is unbeatable at, but it's been almost reduced to that at the expense of a story. And I think if that's true, if that was true, that that's what Watchmen is, then how and why does it work so well on TV (laughs) where (laughs) where it's a different medium entirely? And so this is my new answer. My new answer is Watchmen is the ambition to tell the most carefully refined possible superhero story. That is Watchmen to me is okay. even if it fails, even if it misses, it's not about the characters necessarily, even though mm-hmm. that's that's the universe that we live in and that's the universe that like HBO and Doomsday Clock are inhabiting. It's the ambition to tell the most carefully refined possible superhero story. Moore and Gibbons were really good at that. <laughs> you yeah. know? Like, like, unbeatably so. And not everyone is. And I think, like, the Watchmen shadow 
looms over so much of comics since that time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And not everybody can measure up. A lot of people's ideas about what the most carefully refined superhero story is are very different from the way Morgan Gibbons would have presented it, right? Like right. 90s Youngblood by Rob Liefeld <laughs> is, <laughs> is influenced by Watchmen. It is, you know? Yeah. But but the takeaways are different. The takeaways are more like, oh, grim and gritty, you yeah. know? Um, so, okay. That's kind of what I came to. What do you think? What's what's your answer? I definitely... I I like what you're saying there. I've been thinking a bit about Moore's love of poetry. And um, Tom King brought it up in an interview on uh, Word Balloon, I think, mm -hmm. where he mentioned the fact that poetic writers work differently because of the way that they they try to manage their word count very tightly, very conservatively, and then they write for meter or, or beat in the comic, that things have a pacing to them in a very different way. Yeah. And that's very true. There's an article on, might be CBR, from a, a writer who is talking about the fact that um, the, the nine-panel grid is actually a... Uh, a poetic structure onto itself that it, it manages this beat mm -hmm. so that as their creation definitely plays into what you're talking about of, mm -hmm. of how do you make the best comic but also a comic that can constantly reinforce itself i think that's those are all really good points man mm -hmm. thank you um <laughs> i do think i do think it's also important the piece that i added in there is mm -hmm. the superhero story Mm -hmm. part of this it's not just about like comics perfectionism mm -hmm. because watchmen is not will eisner's contract with god trilogy watchmen is not even even sandman which in some yeah. ways is like almost a superhero comic watchmen yeah. is through and through superhero comics mm -hmm. and it's Moore's love of them you know it's it's more given's love of them and it's also their their attempt to elevate them like you said, yeah. and to update them. And it's very much of the time as well. It's very yeah. much of where are they now? And I think that's so much of what I loved about, I keep coming back to it, but like this year's Peter Cannon Thunderbolt is here's where they are now, right now, right? And that that is meaningful to me um, because it's, Watchmen is not a commentary on like, I don't know, like R. Crumb's indie comics. Yeah. <laughs> You know, like it's not, it's not that it's, it's genre maybe more than it is medium and yeah. where the two intersect. That makes sense. I like yeah. that. I yeah. think for me, um, the answer for what is Watchmen is Shakespearean nihilism. Hmm. That the, the purpose behind Watchmen, um, at least to, to my reading and from going back and checking interviews that Moore did in 85 and 87 and 88 was to say, you know, the same message as nihilism, that you should not accept anyone or anything trying to forcefully impose uh, a set of values or morals on you, which coincidentally is so ironic that it got, it got finished off the same year that DC did their morals clause. <laughs> uh, it's just so bitter. But the whole book is getting into the situation and showing you that heroes you know, are not flawless at all. They're petty, they're jealous, they're lustful. Um, and the book reinstates this by Moore's use of um, Shakespearean techniques, mm -hmm. that he is using language in a way that is to talk up to the reader. Uh, if, you, if you go back and read the text, you'll note that so many of the characters, including Rorschach and, um, and Dr. Manhattan, speak in kind of soliloquy to the audience when yeah. they're writing their journal or they're speaking in their mind. Um, that it's this direct access to their brain. And the book is constantly saying, like, what do you, the audience, think about this? Don't don't just think, like, oh, this is Superman, so he's infallible, um, which Doomsday Clock falls for, for some reason. But, you know, think about this as what do you believe in? And is this wise and should this medium be above you as a person um that's that's really what it is to me yeah and 
You know, I, I think that's kind of where I have a falling out with a lot of the reinterpretations because Doomsday Clock, for some reason, it it, it alludes to that um, to that nihilism, especially in issue six with the Joker, where he's talking about cutting marionette strings and that, you know, these these impositions on you don't mean anything. Um, John's definitely hints at it there. But then the entire bulk of the bulk of the book is saying, well, Watchmen must sit above me and I must constantly reach for it. Yeah. As opposed to doing a similar idea, which is totally antithetical. Um, I think that's what the HBO series gets the closest to being right. And ironically, I kind of wish that they didn't use any Watchmen characters at all. I think it would have worked better. In the, I don't, in the TV show? In the TV show, yeah. Ooh, ooh. I don't think that they, I don't think that they've done a great job with Veet so, or Veit so far. Uh, Doctor Manhattan is just out in the wind, and we're already through the first act. Um, Laurie is an interesting inclusion, but I don't know. Um, I, I, I feel that when HBO Watchmen works, it works best because it's a little off, building a mystery the same way that he did with uh, Lost. Yeah, it's that same. We're just gonna keep throwing things at you, and you're gonna try and figure it out as you go along. And we may not give you all the answers, but maybe they're somewhere in the in the show. There's a lot to unpack there, and we're already at like an hour, so <laughs> I I don't want to say too much about the mystery because I there's a lot of fun ones, and I I, I agree mm -hmm. with the premise. Um, I do wonder the third episode in particular is where we, mm -hmm. it's a Lori Blake centric episode. Yeah. And that's where we, that's the one that really is like, Oh, they're, they're actually more committed to the characters of Watchmen than I expected them to be. Cause through the first two, I was mm -hmm. like, okay, they're out there. And uh, the apparent Ozymandias is, is somewhere. And that's the, but right now he's just all, he's like all weird mystery, right? Yeah. Like just really strange mystery. But then by episode three, he's calling himself Ozymandias. You know, or he's calling himself Adrian Veidt, right? He's declaring, like, yeah, I'm Ozymandias. Um, and, and you get Laurie Blake out there in tons of Watchmen connections. I I definitely liked it. I mean, I have to admit, like, I mm -hmm. liked the use of these characters. Um, I thought Gene Smart as Laurie was just so, like, so exhilarating. Just her, yeah, that was her, a good casting. Well, it's good. It's great casting. It immediately makes me think of Legion, which I love. Which is so there's just mm -hmm. that, you know, like immediate <laughs> happy connection. Um, but then also seeing her thirty plus years later becoming her dad, who at the end of Watchmen we know she hated, hated, yeah. and she's taken his name. Apparently, she operated as the comedian for a bit. That's one of the back matter bits that we get. Oh, um, interesting. Yeah. So and, and she's telling jokes like her dad. It seems mm -hmm. like she has become bitter. In the ways that yeah. Eddie Blake was, and Definitely. bitter and violent, and and maybe a little hopeless, maybe a little nihilistic, right? Not a little, probably a lot. Um, that stuff to me, as a follow up, I didn't expect, and it, it, that actually feels more like something Doomsday Clock would have done, yeah, than than the series. So I'm curious to see how they. I don't want too much of it, but when they toss it in there like that, I like it. So I'm hoping they say no, Regina King, the new Watchman. That's our 80% of our new focus. But mm -hmm. then there's this 20% connective tissue of fleshing out the world of, of squids falling from the sky <laughs> that is going to keep us rooted in that place you already love. Um, Man, the squids falling from the sky did not work for me. That to you was like, we're doing too much Watchmen stuff, yeah? Yeah, yeah. that was kind of like... And on top of which, the fact that it was too much Watchmen stuff and a very little off-feeling mystery... I don't know how to describe how he makes his big questions and shows, but there's almost a feel to them in yeah. the way that he will toss something out that's ridiculous and spectacular, mm -hmm. and then no one really comments too much on it. Yeah. You know, it's... I, it I seems... have to think he's learned... He's had such a fraught relationship with post-Lost Life, obviously, yeah. as a creator and very publicly. Mm -hmm. I would be genuinely surprised if there wasn't more of a conviction to to deliver on these mysteries mm. you know what i mean um maybe but maybe not maybe the squids because the squids when they talk about him in back matter stuff mm -hmm. which again i'm obsessed with 
is uh <laughs> is like it's this scientific phenomenon that no one can explain right. and they keep talking about like there's this mystery to the squids like no one can explain why it's happening so i could see that one just being like no this is just a thing that happens in this world that yeah. they have explained no one understands so we won't understand it either as audience members um but yeah, yeah the, uh, I, I think regina uh, king yeah go ahead i was gonna say regina king comments on that briefly when she was in the car with her son uh in that episode in the first episode when it rained mm-hmm she kind of brings up offhand, like the kid asks, why does this happen? And she says, no one knows. And then it's, yeah. you know. Um, no, I mean, I I could do with less of that. Uh, you're right in that, like, the Lori Blake character is potentially the most interesting. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm, I'm concerned about how they're going to balance that against uh, Sister Knight so that one isn't dominating the other. Yeah, sure. And I'm especially concerned because she's come in, you know, Lori has come in very late. And Lidloff already said at New York Comic Con that he that this show may only go the one season. Right. And HBO has been telegraphing uh, a little a little concern because this isn't doing Game of Thrones numbers, which is what I don't know if they expected, but maybe it's what they told stockholders they were going to get. That's uh, interesting. Yeah. You know, they're, they're looking to find something that replaces that hole, and we go back to Doomsday Clock. Uh, how does this compare to the business plan? Which you and I don't have access to, but mm-hmm. sometimes seems a little bit... Uh, you can see the shape of it. It would be fascinating to me if, if Watchmen, the TV series, lived a short life because it was critically acclaimed, but not a hit. <laughs> right. <laughs> that would actually be... I think probably pretty telling um, yeah. about about appetites and maybe about what the future of superhero TV and movies is going to be is like because mm-hmm. I think one of the probably more obvious things that people have taken away from the show so far is, oh, HBO Watchmen is doing for superhero TV, superhero movies, what the comic did for superhero comics. And okay. to me, you know, like it's elevating them. It's telling these literary uh big you know tackling racial insensitivity mm-hmm. racial injustice in in ways that only watchmen can do and i always wondered not always but for the last decade i've wondered like what is the what's the property going to be that does for superhero genre outside of comics what watchmen did and the yeah. irony of it just being like well it actually just has to be watchmen is <laughs> <laughs> kind of crazy to me and kind of disappointing it's kind of yeah. disappointing it couldn't be something new you know well yeah, I mean, I understand why the DC suits would want to stick with a known brand. Uh, I would challenge you on your point that HBO's Watchmen is, you know, breaking the mold for television, movies, and films, I think you said. I would argue that that was Legion. I just okay. don't think that yeah. Legion was as accessible. Legion's uh, much as, weirder. Yeah, but it's it tackles the same issues, like... The fact that the last two seasons are really all about consent yeah. is, you know, a, a spectacular nod to what it can do socially. Yeah. Um, I just think that Little Off has maybe, maybe found some ways to make the weirdness more publicly accessible than Legion did. Well, Watchmen is very... I, I guess that's kind of where I come down a little surprised by maybe a lack of, of um, success is it's very, uh, it's very accessible. It's very yeah. entertaining in the yeah. ways that like we expect superhero media to be, and and Legion is not. Uh, no, Legion is not playing by those rules. It is very mm. high minded, and I love I love Legion, but I would not expect Legion to get um, Game of Thrones numbers. But you know what no. I mean? Like that's, so that is not a world we live in. Um, but in a way, I, I thought that close. Legion. I in a way, I thought that Legion was more like Alan Moore's Watchmen. Maybe even than uh, HBO's Watchmen is. Okay, so that's that's my new title for uh, for this episode is Why Legion is the New Watchmen. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping we'd call it More Crisis. <laughs> more Crisis on, on Infinite Allens. Um Yeah, no, that totally works. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you're right. I think Watchmen is not... I don't want to overstate it as, yeah. as this inventive explosion, but I guess that's kind of... 
that's kind of what we you and I have alluded to about the comic too though is like it became this thing that changed comics Mm -hmm. but it didn't it told a story that's a really fun entertaining superhero mystery yeah at the end of the day so like I mean outside of the criticism about how it handled you know sexual consent and race and LGBT but yeah fun fun is probably the wrong (laughs) yeah definitely the wrong word because absolutely there are criticisms and they're really interesting criticisms um, Mm -hmm. that everyone should read because like honestly like Alan Moore was not capable of telling a story from I don't know 1982 to 1991 without like sexual violence like he he couldn't do it and Mm -hmm. I say that as someone who is completely wowed by his writing but also like really doesn't like that aspect so yes there are problems absolutely um that said it's still like it still hits at the pop sensibilities of a story and that's why I think it is so beloved Watchmen HBO is doing the same thing while also throwing in high-minded mystery confusion yeah. everything with adrian okay. veit v if you don't know watchmen especially is like mm-hmm. has to just be like what is this what is yeah. this like that play he's doing the watchmaker's son is so weird it's so weird and i don't even knowing yeah. it i'm like i don't know why he's doing this stuff i don't i don't have a clue what's going on here yeah i uh, i i don't know you're right uh yeah, that's that whole part with Vite is going to be interesting. I really feel that maybe HBO's Watchmen was written more in mind for people who never read uh, the original. Maybe they were intimidated. Maybe it got talked up too much. Um, because the way that it handles Vite just feels so different from the comics. Yeah. That I, I right. don't understand. Uh, I... I I get little bits of what's happening, I think, just based on, you know, having read the material. But that's that's either going to be a really great payoff or it's going to be a really upsetting payoff for me, and I don't know which one, especially I mean, if it only Vite, goes one season. Vite right now is the Jacob of of Watchmen. You know, <laughs> he's he's lost Jacob because if it turns out that the the answers to those questions aren't that interesting, the show's mm-hmm. going to have a really big hole in it. <laughs> you yeah. know, we're going to wonder why we spent all this weird time on his yeah. island and then we're going to have to make those lostian arguments about well the time experiment exploring those mysteries was pretty entertaining even if the answer mm-hmm. sucked. Um as opposed to what I'm hoping which is an explosive answer. I mean, the first thing that came to mind with me with the episode 3 and big time spoilers mm-hmm. for the show here if you haven't watched. I feel like Dr. Manhattan's got him imprisoned. On some yeah. weird off world, like I don't think he's in Scotland. This game yeah. warden character d- doesn't seem like the once in future Ozymandias would be kept mm-hmm. at bay by a human. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I think it's I think it's going to be connected to Doctor Manhattan. Let me let me ask two questions there. One, yeah. do you have the same thought or a different one? Two, are we going to see Doctor Manhattan? And should we? I think we both probably have the same answer here. Uh, I definitely had the same thought. I was kind of thinking that this was some sort of time prison. That he's that on a loop, uh, kind Manhattan. Of thing. What's that? Like he's on a loop. Yeah, that he's existing outside of normal time. Mm. Uh, because you know Manhattan just dragged him, threw him into a parallel universe or something. Yeah. Um, that was sort of my thought, but I'm also kind of. I'm confused about the structure of it because it doesn't really to to fit that idea. It doesn't really make sense um, the construction of how they have the uh, the caretakers because they seem more like imperfect clones, and mm-hmm. which is definitely making clones is definitely a Doctor Manhattan thing, but it's also an Adrian Veidt thing. Yeah, um, right. And now we've got the game warden, and I'm like, I don't know what's going there. Uh, yeah. That's a little perilous. But yeah, I, I definitely saw it that way. As for whether or not we should see Dr. Manhattan in the show, I think no. I think that if we are going to make the argument, as a number of the Watchmen reinterpretations have made, that uh, that Manhattan is basically God now, mm-hmm. then he should be like God and be removed. Yeah. Yeah, I think I would agree. I I think the most I wanted to see of him was what mm-hmm. we got at the end of episode three, 
which was, hey, Lori, I got your joke, and I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah. I like that touch. That was good. Like That was very good. That's enough service to Dr. Manhattan, mm-hmm. to me, to be like, he's out there. And guess what? He's actually listening. Surprisingly. He's actually kind of listening to Lori, um, but that's all we're going to get. And yeah. it, I'd be, I would be 100% fine with that. I think I'd be a little surprised if the show didn't agree. I'd, be, mm-hmm. I'd actually be very surprised if they were like, actually, we want to introduce this blue superpowered person into this yeah. world. It just that's, doesn't feel right to me. No, that's a whole level of unreality that doesn't mesh with the very real um, discussion of racial injustice and racial violence. Like it's just yeah. trying to, you know, trying to merge those two is ugh. Speaking of trying to merge things that don't work, Doomsday mm-hmm. Clock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you think there's a future, depending on how issue 12 ends, of of Watchmen being inside the DC universe that works. Like is there is there a version of that in comics that is a good thing? So far no. Yeah. I don't it feels too disruptive. Uh and especially since like Watchmen came out after DC bought the rights to the Charleston characters but was not doing anything with them. Right. Um so that's how Moore got to write his parodies of them. But now that the question is actually in the DC universe, now that um, the Atom is in there. Blue Beetle. Blue Beetle, um, who they allude to, which was fun. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what we're doing. Like, how are you going to have Rorschach and the question occupying pretty much the same space? Yeah. That doesn't make sense. What else sounds boring? Like, it just sounds duplicative, you know? Yeah, no, totally. I mean, you would basically just have a, you know, a slight um, tone swap on characters, and that's it. And that's yeah. the only the only thing I could see them doing. Not the only thing, but probably the most realistic thing I could see them doing is Doctor Manhattan and Superman hash it out mm-hmm. in issue twelve here, and the Watchmen people go back to Watchmen world, and yeah. that becomes a part of the of the multiverse. Maybe now we get mm-hmm. a fifty third. No, I think it's our well. Whatever. It's in there. Whatever. It's, it's in there. Earth four. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I actually like, looked that up. That world is part of the is part of the DC multiverse now, and we could get like you said a Watchmen imprint that is mm-hmm. like a post a post Doomsday Clock world where then they can do their HBO Watchmen stories. Yeah. Right. So then instead of before Watchmen, they can kick off after Watchmen. And right. and bring in whatever creators that want to touch it, and do it that way. I could see that being probably pretty frowned upon and met with not a lot of fanfare, but attempted. Yeah, um, I could see that. I think otherwise, the idea of Rorschach staying in Gotham, no, thank you. No, 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 no. Yeah, I I would love to see them open up an imprint where they tell creators like. Just explore what this book means to you. Do something that's, you know, of the same mind, um, but ignore all the rest. I would love to see Sean Murphy create a, a Watchmen book. Sure. Like after yeah. his work on Punk Rock Jesus, that just makes sense. Yeah. That uh, that idea I like is to black label it and just say, mm-hmm. just do your thing and don't worry about this incontinuity stuff. And then yeah. Doomsday Clock, the ending is just, okay. Dr. Manhattan gives us the metaverse, he gives us that explanation, and then he goes away. And he takes everybody with him, <laughs> and and I don't, whatever, Batman can remember he read Rorschach's journal, fine, but like, they're not going to come up again. Maybe he'll kill both Manhattan and Superman, and it will just parallel the uh, the P.I. story that they've been playing over and over. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I think that's a terrible idea, but that's really my take what, on <laughs> what other what other IP do they own that they can tease now as the um as the other hand that's controlling right? things, you know. <laughs> uh, man, <laughs> I don't know. But I don't I mean, there's no good resolution because to DC they want these characters just like they want all characters in main continuity. I mean, hell, um Red Sun Superman is now part of main continuity. Right. They're just right. going to keep they're just going to keep dragging these things in there because they want to, you know, have their toys play with other people's toys. That's it. Yeah. Um that's that's the most disappointing answer if that mm-hmm. becomes reality because then it's just it's just such a transparent business case which mm-hmm. is which is t- 
tends to be very negative. <laughs> yeah. For, and for is a, and is again totally antithetical to the book. Yeah. Like if that's what they wind up doing with it, uh, I I don't think that's going to work out for them. Yeah. Um, and man, I wish we could spend the next hour complaining about businesses making business decisions, but I know, I know, it's not really going to work out. All right. Well, this has been World of Watchmen, Comic Book Herald Deep Dives. John, this is fun. Thanks mm-hmm. for talking about it. Um, you can find more it's of our time. work over on comicbookherald.com, including uh, Watchmen commentary, as we got a Watchmen universe reading order, and mm-hmm. all sorts of uh, Doomsday Clock reading order, actually, if you want to read the, the DC Rebirth stories that sort of sets the stage for it. And, of course, I'll include some of that in the show notes. John, anything you want to plug? No. I mean, I've got, a, I've got another Superpowers article coming out pretty soon that should be interesting, but that's about it. Cool, cool. Yeah, find all John's writing over on CBH, and uh, you know I'll include the link for the deep dives here in the show notes. So thanks, everybody, for listening, watching, however you consume this, and enjoy the comics. Take care.